We also, wonderful, thank you. Oh yeah, and there's Terry, I can make her, I can admit her right now too. Okay, we also, um, I wanna let you know that we have uh, quite a few more talks coming up, which we're looking forward to. And you'll be able to find the schedule for all the talks at innovatebio.org. And that will be in the events section. Um, I also want to let you know that next week we're going to be taking a break on talks, but after that we'll be back on March 4th. Kristen Vanderwall Mills will be talking about science attitudes and career goals, and um, we'll also hear about a, a high school collaborative ATE project, and that will, um, which is a work-based biotechnology education from high school to community college from Drs. Golnar Ashfar and Karen Zimmerman at the City College of San Francisco. Okay, um, our goals for this series are to showcase the advanced technology education projects. This one today is a little bit of an exception because this is a project that's in progress, but we thought it would still be useful for you to see how people put together their coalitions and how they get started on their work. We are thinking about having a day later on um, this spring where we have people who are interested in getting feedback on ATE, on developing ATE projects, give pitches and talk about what they're interested in and uh, the audience can ask questions and give feedback. Our goal here really is to help the community learn what's involved in developing ATE projects and make the community successful. We are continuing this conversation on Slack, if you're interested, I will put the link to Slack in chat a little bit later. And uh, let me see, I guess without further, uh, without further ado, Todd, take it away. All right, thanks, Sandy. Um, yeah, so as Sandy mentioned, we're um, working with uh, ABRF to develop a consortium for uh, biotech education. And I'm gonna start my screen sharing. Hopefully everybody can see my first slide and only one slide. Sandy will run out from the other room and tell me if that's not the case. So, um, so the title, working title right now is opening a door uh, into biotechnology careers, developing the core technology workforce. And what we're going to do today is, is I'm going to give you an overview of, of what the ABRF is and why this is important. Then we're going to hear from some of my colleagues from the ABRF. And then I'll finish with uh, some thoughts uh, about how we're developing the grant. And so, as I mentioned, it's a consortium proposal that we're, we're developing. And, um, and what I'm gonna do is go through the importance of biomolecular analysis. I'm gonna introduce Core Labs. We also call them Shared Research Resources, SRRs, and the ABRF. The ABRF is an association of people who run these labs. Then we're gonna hear from the experts, as I mentioned. And then I'll describe the consortium and close with how you can get involved. So the motivation for this is, you know, within, within our community, and, and everybody's pretty familiar with this, is we often talk about biotechnology in terms of the products that are produced. You think about, you know, medical health, drugs, vaccines, things like that, diagnostics, nutrition, industrial products, synthetic biology, agriculture. But we often talk about products, you know, so biomanufacturing, these are very, very important things, but to make these products without exception, you need to have measurement systems. And today those measurement systems are very complex. So the real foundation of biotechnology is biomolecular analysis. And, and that involves, you know, high throughput DNA sequencing, advanced um, imaging and microscopy, it, invo it involves uh, flow cytometry. You're not gonna do a lot of cell manufacturing and gene therapy without sorting those cells. And also mass spec and other technologies that um, are in proteomics. Um, a lot of times we talk about DNA sequencing for identity, but it turns out for a lot of the protein molecules that get produced, people need to do mass spec analysis to prove the identity of the protein that's been um, um, been made. And this is done with very high end instrumentation. You, know, you don't buy one of these and, and put them on your bench in the lab. You put them in a room and people run them. And so the people who run them form what we call a core laboratory or a shared resource, <clears throat> shared resource, um, research resource facility. 
And they, uh, the people in those labs, they operate this equipment. They have a lot of training and education to operate it. They, um, as I noted, they're very specialized instruments and they're also very specialized techniques. So it's not just running an instrument, it's also producing the, uh, the materials that go onto that instrument. DNA prep, uh, sample prep, um, cell prep, antibodies, all of these things go into that biomolecular analysis. And so the laboratories, really what they do is they provide a lot of expertise and services to their research communities in, in terms of how to set up experiments properly, how to make sure you have the right controls, what kind of informatics you need to, uh, to get meaning from this. And it's, it's, um, the core labs are both in research institutions, but they're also in industry as well. And, and so together, um, we're gonna work with ABRF to talk about what the careers look like and what the training could be. And, and really, I wanna make this point is the cores, to do this, they have a lot of specially trained uh, technicians that are running the instruments and equipment. And so it's a very good job growth opportunity for people. The other aspect I wanna point out is core labs are businesses. So, you know, I noted the services. Well, this, these services result in scientific consulting. There's technical support, there's data review. Um, you need to plan the experiments. How long do things take? What do things cost? They have to manage the finance and administration. And, and together, these form actually multidimensional career pathways for people who enter the lab. So you can start out at the bench, but you can end up running the core labs for your administration as you learn how the, uh, the business end of running a core works. So who is the ABRF? So we've learned, you know, core lab is, is where you find these instruments and a lot of people who uh, have the specialized uh, education to run them. The ABRF is an association of biomolecular resource facilities. And the association has been around for, well, close to 40 years. And I've been a member for over 20 years. So uh, for those of you who, who know me know that I had a, a bioinformatics company before I was doing this. And the ABRF was actually one of my uh, really important um, markets in terms of the core labs because we supported a lot of the labs with our, with our software. Today, the national network has over 1800 members and they're from more than 350 institution in 47 states and 17 countries with five regional chapters. If you think of some of the themes of NSF, um, you know, international travel and working with universities and things like that, ABRF is gonna be a, a really great way to work with people to, um, to uh, develop proposals for doing those kinds of things. The members develop best practices. So, you know, to do those services, you have to know the deep science behind them, and you also have to know how the methods work. And so there's a lot of activities within ABRF to uh, design to uh, get at these issues. Uh, through this, as a community of, of people who work together, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, it's a, a very, very professional society. There's a lot of education, communication, and mentoring. So because, you know, core labs require both a business acumen and a technical acumen, ABRF members work together to teach people how to do these things. And it's, it's, it's really pretty cool. Also, ABRF is very active in policy and advocacy. So they're a member of the Federation, uh, the um, Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, FASEB. FASEB does a lot of things, including lobbying Congress. You know, so how do we get additional research funding for NIH, for NSF, for these kinds of things? And ABRF is very involved in that. And then finally, it's self-governed and run by volunteer committees. So um, it's a really cool dimension. There's, there's a lot of committees in ABRF. Um, it's, um, some of them are involved in research. Some of them are involved in you know, organizing and managing the society. So it's, it's a great place to get involved and, and develop leadership skills. ABRF also has very important industry ties. So one of the things you know, is, is a group of employers, ABRF in ATE speak really represents industry, but also these labs have bring this equipment in from the vendors and these vendors also need an advanced uh, technical workforce. So, so it's really a multi-dimensional kind of opportunity for people who uh, could come in and start working with uh, core labs. And so what I wanna do now is stop talking and we're gonna hear from some of our uh, ABRF colleagues, our experts. And so we're gonna hear first from uh, Jane Srivastava about her career path and a little bit about flow cytometry because 
we've identified that both as a, as a critical need for the core labs um, and also a critical need within the community college network because industry actually needs a lot of flow cytometry these days. You know, we've had a lot of presentations on gene and cell therapy and um, well, it's, it's uh, people are getting poached. And so we need to have, uh, have technicians entering the labs. Uh, Justine uh, Kiyungi and Andy uh, Chitty are gonna talk a little bit about a career development within their institutions. And then Terry's gonna give us a little bit of, uh, of a wrap up, Terry Quenzer on uh, kind of her thoughts from what she's seen from, from attending the meeting. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, hand it over to you, Jane. Great, hopefully everyone can hear me and see my screen. Please let me know if you can. Great, uh, thanks so much, Todd. I am really pleased to be part of this project and my heart is really in something like this. I define myself as a career technician. Um, and so something like this would have been wonderful for me back 25 years ago when I was starting my career. So today I'm definitely going to talk to you about uh, a little bit about my career and um, as a technician where I've come from and where I'm going hopefully and also about the flow and outline for a flow cytometry program that we have uh, put together. So my own technician story starts in New Zealand, where I'm from, I'm from Christchurch in New Zealand, um, but I lived in London in the UK for 14 years um, before shifting to San Francisco with my family a couple of years ago, just straight before the pandemic hit actually. <laughs> so not good timing. Um, so my story really involves a lot of different pathways from having children to working in some really interesting uh, core labs. Uh, the, this is a tuberculosis lab at UCSF, um, which was fun uh, fitting out in that outfit, uh, to fitting into small spaces. So I've done a lot of my career of very interesting things. So I got my Bachelor of Science from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. I majored in microbiology but I've never actually worked in it. I don't actually like bacteria much, um, but I, I just found that it, was, it wasn't really me after doing several years of that. Um, I did bounce around uh, through various research assistant and research technician roles, um, mainly in molecular labs. So I was doing a lot of DNA sequencing and things like that at the Christchurch School of Medicine and at the Canterbury Health Labs. Um, I uh, got introduced to flow in my third role as a research technician at the haematology research group. Um, I'd never heard of flow cytometry, but I liked the other half of the role, which was cell culture and sequencing. So I got kind of dumped into this role and I, I found flow cytometry instantly fascinating. I really enjoyed um, uh, playing with machines and lasers and fluorescence. It was definitely me. I then moved to the UK to be a research technician there in a core flow cytometry facility in the Medical Research Council and from there I jumped over into University College London where I was an assistant lab manager for the immunity infection department there and also they had a small flow cytometry lab that I um, that I managed as well. I then moved to Imperial College in London where I managed um, the flow cytometry instruments for a cardiomyocyte research group before I applied for a role to become the flow cytometry facility manager for a campus at Imperial College London. And they really wanted me to build the facility because there wasn't anything there. So I had a great time doing that. And finally, I am the flow cytometry core director at the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco. This is a nonprofit research institute. We're associated, associated with UCSF. We sit right on the edge of the Mission Bay campus. And our main um, institutes are virology, genomic immunology, neurology, and cardiology. Lots of ologies there. So my main role in getting into core management was at Imperial College. Um, it was part of, the core was part of the natural sciences faculty and the life sciences department, but we actually serviced the whole of that beautiful campus in South Kensington there. Uh, the flow core when I started was really just one instrument and just me, um, but by the time I left there was eight, uh, eight instruments, uh, two and a half of us, one person working part-time. We serviced three faculties, 15 departments, and we had 200 active users of the facility. I got a lot involved in teaching and designing theoretical and practical undergraduate and postgraduate um, courses and conferences and seminars and workshops. 
and management, which was probably the hardest bit for me, um, to be honest, was uh, kind of uh, getting involved in the budget decisions and planning and and um, and dealing with sort of the politics of dealing with people from different departments. So that was definitely a, an eye-opening time. Um, so I decided not to go back into academia. I really liked being a technician. I really liked uh, working in a core lab, but I decided I needed to do a little bit more in terms of education and qualifications, uh, especially in regards to teaching, because I do a lot of teaching. So I um, became a fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK, and I also did a postgraduate diploma in university teaching and learning. Um, and then I became a certified cytometrist. So the ACP have some also have some wonderful courses for technicians. And I became a registered scientist in the UK, which is a technician um, acknowledging kind of qualification. Um, and there's various levels as well. So that's really, that's something new in the UK and it is really amazing. So at the moment I work at the Dave, uh, J. David Gladstone Institutes. Um, I'm the Flow Cytometry Core Director, and I'm really starting to spread my wings there after the pandemic slowly lifting. Um, I'm starting to do some research projects of my own, um, and I am a chair of the UCSF Gladso Flow Committee and a co-chair of the AVR Flow Cytometry Research Group. And I find all those things great and, and really a learning experience for me. So what is flow cytometry if, you, if you're not really aware of it? This statement is very wordy, it has a lot of words, <laughs> but it is really a fantastic kind of description by Catherine McKinnon in um, current protocols in cytometry about what flow is. So just to, just to summarize, you have a cell over here on the right. Um, our main body of work is really to do with antibodies. So you tag the cell surface or, or inside the cell with these fluorescent um, antibodies. And then you uh, pop them into a stream of, of PBS. A laser comes across and hits the cell and the fluorescent tag is excited and releases its photons, which are shuttled down a various set of fiber optic cables and into detectors um, that then release the signal and can be plotted on a plot. <laughs> a graph. Uh, so there are many, many applications for flow cytometry, both in clinical and in research. You will find uh, cytometers as a mainstay in routine hem hematology and immunology labs, and also in speci uh, specific labs like transplant labs and blood transfusion. There are a lot of, from the beginning of a cell life, maybe from stem cells right through to a cell death, you can find a flow cytometry application for that. And there are more and more um, different tests coming out that uh, flow tests, which are really quite wonderful and, um, and interesting for us in the flow course. So in terms of a flow cytometry course outline, what I, what I really wanted to cover was the core concepts of flow um, in this, and a few in this course. And if, if students kind of understand these core concepts, they can, they can build on those really quite nicely. I think, you know, there's so many different cytometers, there's so many different styles of teaching, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have these core concepts in place, then, then you're good to go. So week one would be an intro to flow cytometry, an intro to its applications and whereabouts it's used. FOE stands for fluidics, optics, and electronics. So those are the three basic components of a flow cytometer and how they all fit together. And spectral cytometry is kind of a new player in the field, but I think it's very important. It's a new way of, you get the same output as a flow cytometer, but it's a new way of looking um, at the fluorescent dyes where you're looking at the whole signature rather than just a, a small filtered section of it. Um, and that means we can do many more colors in the same tube and um, things like extract autofluorescence and things like that. So this is a really important thing for the students to know. Week two would be experimental design. Um, because there's a lot to do uh, outside of just popping your tube on a cytometer. There's things like sample preparation, uh, controls with a capital, uh, with an exclamation mark, because they're really one of the most important features of a flow experiment, and antibody panel design, which, which, is, which seems simple, but is not. <laughs> 
So week three would be looking at, once you combine these antibodies, we'll be looking at the issues that come up with that, such as spilling of one fluorescence into another channel, which is compensation, data spread, and really optimizing those fluorescent um, antibody panels so that you get some really good quality data out the other end. Week four would be data analysis. It's just two words, but really quite a big subject. So it would cover a whole week where we're looking at the software, software, different softwares that can analyze um, flow data and everything from gating your data to the statistics that you use to larger programs that handle a lot more data that have recently come out. And then week five, we would briefly cover self-sorting. So optimizing for that can be a little bit different to normal flow experiments. So we're optimizing for purity and viability of your cells that have been sorted. And then something called forensic flow, which is um, I know when somebody can use a cytometer well is that when they're able to troubleshoot their, their experiments, either um, their design of their experiment or what's happening on the instrument. So we would give the students a lot of problems that they can try and solve what issues they are. So I think it's a really good way to learn. And all of these would be based on kind of modern educational theory. So instead of somebody just standing there lecturing to them, the students would really get involved with um, peer-based discussions and, and team-based discussions and, and hands-on um, hands stuff as well. So thank you very much, that's it from me. And I would like to stop sharing and hand it over to Justine. All right. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Jane. All right. Uh, Jen just gave us, um, told us about her journey in a career, a career, a career path in a, a core facility. And my presentation attempts to uh, paint a broader paintbrush of the potential career opportunities available in a typical core facility. And I'll use our uh, biomedical imaging center as uh, an example. Uh, the Hoagland Biomedical Imaging Center is um, a regional resource within the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, we are we combine imaging modalities under one roof and we serve uh, primarily KMC investigators and about a dozen other area institutions. So really a key regional resource. Uh, we have uh, scientists and support staff that not only conduct their own research studies, but they also enable collaborations, develop novel imaging, imaging techniques and methods and, and support various other collaborations in both human and animal models. Um, this is um, a snapshot of some of our career paths. Um, our center is led by a scientific director, and we have two primary tracks within the center. Uh, we have a technical track, and this is uh, primarily instrument-based. And then we have this team science and collaboration, which does not necessarily involve being hands-on on a piece of equipment, but just really being integrated in the whole uh, team, uh, supporting data analysis, study coordinations. We do a lot of clinical research studies, and so those require a lot of collaboration and coordination. And so our technical track, as you can see, we have technologists, associates, technologists, senior technologists, and, and several others, all the way down to core directors. And then on the team science or collaborations um, track, um, we have research assistants, uh, research associates. These are the broad categories, but in between, this can be punctuated by senior or associate, but these are sort of the main catch-all categories. We are state institutions, so some of our positions are broadly defined at the state level, but we try to punctuate them with what we call working titles to fit the, the profile of the job itself. Um, and, as, and, and as Todd mentioned, core facilities really run as businesses, really supporting both science and business. And so as such, we have other skilled specialized jobs, uh, such as you know, systems and computer support, uh, we have clinical nurses at all levels. We have business associates, analysts, and support staff in that area, finance and administration. So those are all part of the broad ecosystem. 
Um, this is just one example of a career progression. Um, these are real examples of people that have moved through our ranks in the center, in our center. Uh, this particular person started out with us as a research intern. Um, and the reason I shared this is because sometimes our students think they are you know, great barriers to entering the core science, uh, the core um, uh, and science broadly, but we offer internships and externships and volunteer opportunities and shadowing opportunities. And these really help students get their foot in the door. And we've had very much success in hiring uh, some of these interns and students. They come to us uh, from community colleges. Some of them start as early as high school and they join our team and they learn about the techniques, they learn about the research environment and it grows their interest and you know, they are less intimidated. They know there's, there are lots of possibilities. And then uh, this particular, Person uh, studied out as an intern, became a research assistant, later on a research associate, and then a senior research associate, and they are now functioning as a from functioning as a core manager. Uh, one thing that I will note is that they started out with us um, for a formal position as a research assistant. They had a bachelor's degree, uh, but as uh, my colleague Andy is going to share, um, the institution has started a career track whereby they are emphasizing skills over um, other things. Um, um, he will share this uh, next up to me, but yeah, this, this particular person uh, entered the, our center with a bachelor's degree and moved all the way to core manager and is still um, at, at that level. Um, and this is another example of uh, another individual that started with us as a research assistant and then um, some of the positions that I have shared, um, because imaging, our imaging is very highly skilled to be able to move through the ranks to get to other higher levels like senior scientists and beyond and program manager, um, there are opportunities to go for, you know, other qualifications, including, you know, attaining more formal education or skilled training. And so these are things that we truly encourage and being uh, a research institution and an education institution we offer opportunities for uh, our staff to rise through the ranks and, and take advantage of, the, of those opportunities to move from the entry level to other higher levels. And that's it from me. And next you'll hear from my colleague, Andy, who will um, give more, talk more about how they have uh, pro moved towards professionalizing core facility tracks. Thank you, Justine. I'm getting ready to share my screen. Can everyone see that first slide that says core scientist? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Andy, uh, Andy Chitty. I am the director of the University Shared Resources at Oregon Health Science University. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of gloss through the first couple of bullets because I think Todd did a great job of introducing what cores are um, and, and the people that uh, staff them. Um, they do provide uh, uh, a vibrant research environment uh, for investigators to be able to use cores. Uh, and they're staffed by scientists with specialized education. Um, these are technically advanced people that oftentimes acquire their skills uh, working in the cores themselves. Um, and they're service focused. They deliberately follow a career pathway uh, that's distinct from the typical uh, research lab scientist. Um, for some reason, my screen is not advancing. Let's try that. There we go. And uh, how are they different from traditional research? Uh, general research staff positions are personnel and academic research positions that are gaining experience oftentimes for future opportunities. For example, they might be uh, involved in publications or they might be learning uh, uh, about grant writing so that later as faculty members, they can write their own grants and, uh, and uh, bring in their own funding. Uh, like I mentioned, the core staff are, uh, um, actually pursue careers in service and research support. So they're helping those general research staff members do their projects. So while a general research staff might be focusing on one or a number of um, uh, focused projects, the core staff is, is working on many, many projects for many people institution-wide. So because of that, core scientists' job descriptions differ significantly from traditional research scientists. 
But uh, the problem is, is that they're often lumped in with the traditional research scientists. And um, the reason why that's a problem uh, is they are uh, lumped there without the long-term career benefits uh, because general research are oftentimes looking forward to uh, different objectives long-term for their own careers. And core scientists are not looking at the same objectives. So that's limiting for the scientists in cores. So what we're doing right now at OHSU is, um, is changing the titles of the core scientist. You can see here's the track on the left-hand side for general research, um, research assistant one through senior research associate. And the core scientist track starts with assistant core scientist and goes all the way up to senior core scientist. So I took, I stole one of the um, uh, images from Justine's, um, uh, one of her slides to just kind of give you an idea that KUMC and OHSU general research tracks uh, and their general research job families use a lot of the same terms, uh, research assistant, research associate, and, and that's quite common among uh, institutions um, nationwide. And as you can see down below, uh, uh, the OHSU core scientist uh, track um, starts with the assistant core scientist and up. And what that does is that offers a distinct and professionalized and long-term potential career trajectory for someone in the core. So we changed the titles. Uh, you know, what does that really do? In our case, what it does is it changes the job descriptions, allows us to write more, more appropriate job descriptions uh, for the core scientist, uh, but it also changes the entry level requirements. Um, it, it fundamentally changes the way that we can advance the careers uh, with an emphasis on skill sets, as uh, Justine mentioned, as opposed to traditional formal education requirements, such as a bachelor's or a master's plus number of years of experience. And, Really importantly for the people in the cores, the salaries are evaluated distinctly from standard research. Uh, this is a little bit more analogous to commercial entities who are our competition for staff. As Todd mentioned, um, we have a lot of staff members because we train people so well that are hired away by, by uh, commercial entities who can um, offer uh, different salary levels. But this also offers them um, a home in academia, the, uh, the, the staff members, if they want to stay in academia. And it, 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 importantly, it is an appropriate salary uh, for a long-term career opportunity for people who work in the course. So this is what gets me really excited, the opportunities that, uh, that this presents to us in the cores at OHSU, um, it, as I mentioned, it, it lifts the barriers to entry. We have a different opportunity for people who maybe don't have a bachelor's degree that are coming out of community colleges. Um, we can perhaps look at providing internships for people who are in community colleges and uh, with the idea that they're going to stay on as, as core um, staff members and, and advance their career. We're already starting to do outreach to Portland Community Colleges, our uh, regional community colleges. Um, in, in our area to develop some of these oppor opportunities. Um, it also has ramifications for diversity and equity and inclusion and you know, looking at socioeconomically uh, underserved communities, whether or not we can bring people in uh, so that they can uh, have opportunities to advance their, their careers or get started in a career that uh, perhaps they hadn't thought about or thought that they were qualified uh, to, to do before. Um, there's also the opportunity to advance inside and out the core, outside the core. You can start your career in a core and continue to advance there, or you can start your career in a core and move on to commercial uh, opportunities. We don't want to lose people to commercial entities, but um, if, if that's someone's goal, this is a great uh, way to, to, to get to gain some of the skills. Uh, but at least this way they have a choice as opposed to feeling like they only have one way to advance their career, and that's, that's leaving the core. So the bottom line really is that core careers are valuable uh, and we need to advance and acknowledge, acknowledge that value of the core careers to benefit all the stakeholders, uh, in particular, those people who work in the cores. Thank you. Hey, thanks. And Terry, when we, when we did, we did a practice and, and uh, Terry was so excited. She had this, this wonderful slide. Um, I hope you still have it. I do. And, all right. Uh, 
<laughs> Thanks, Todd. And I figured too that it might be helpful to give a little bit of my background as well because it really kind of ties what we're doing together and with um, the core labs because I think that might have been a really fun career path for me because so I started and I'm just going to do the short version of mine um, and that is my PhD is in analytical chemistry. Well, actually back up right now, I'm the executive director of the Bioscience Workforce Development Hub hosted at Maricosta College and serving the California Community Colleges. And uh, I started out with a PhD in analytical chemistry and my PhD mentor is uh, the co-inventor of the triple quadrupole mass spectrometer, Chris Anke, and went on and did my postdoc with the co-inventor of Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectroscopy. And that's Alan Marshall at the National High Magnetic Field Lab in, at Florida State University. So I specialize in mass spectrometry. And, uh, and even at the magnet lab, we used to do similar things to what the core labs do. We worked with a lot of researchers and they came and visited us and we helped them run their samples and get, get data. Um, I went on to Pfizer where I did uh, uh, special method development on projects and I was early in the proteomics. So I worked with structure-based drug design and uh, did um, protein mass spec, working with recombinant proteins for the um, preclinical projects. And while I was at Pfizer, I also was working on the Biocom Education Committee and very engaged and passionate about working with students and helping them transition from their education to industry. So I hired a lot of interns and so it kind of naturally led me to where I am now. So I will share my screen and show you uh, this diagram that, let me see, let me go ahead into, see if I can get that mode. There we go. Can everybody see that? Okay, so um, I, I think this all ties together really nicely. And that is, um, I'm, I'm showing a, a, a pathway uh, a life science pathway, uh, which includes career and education. And if you start with K-12 in high school, you have some choices. You can go to work or you can go to a community college where you get employable skills, or you can go on to a, go to a four-year university straight from high school and get a bachelor's degree. Uh, from the community colleges, you can transfer for a bachelor's degree at a four-year institute or in California, we have two colleges right now that have a bachelor's degree in biomanufacturing, which uh, gives employable skills as well. And uh, by the way, the bachelor's degree programs were just signed into law in October. So now we can have up to 30 programs approved every year in California. And it's not just in biomanufacturing, uh, but it has to serve uh, an area that's not served by any of the four-year institutions. But anyway, that's a pathway. Uh, and then from either of the bachelor's degree programs, you can go on to graduate school. And the point of this is that at every point along the pathway, you have access to employment. And often when you're employed, uh, there might be tuition reimbursement programs and such that can help you advance in your career. So what I love about this is the core labs really fit into this, this pathway nicely because you can go to work at the core labs, get training. You just saw a lot of really great illustrations of the pathways at the core labs. So you can get great experience that can end it on your pathway while you're being trained and advancing or while you're working. So I just wanted to share this because uh, I'm very excited about this project and very excited about how the core labs fit into our pathways at the community colleges. So I'll hand it back to you, Todd. Great. And I will try to make sure to share the right window. Okay, so we've heard from our experts. Um, so briefly, I'm just gonna take a couple minutes and, and walk through what the consortium could look like and what we're thinking about in terms of activities. You've heard about one with flow cytometry. So, so really what we want to do is develop new collaborations between two large networks. One is, is the Innovate Bio Network of our colleagues uh, that are, are teaching in community college programs in biotech. 
and uh, with with the uh, ABRF. And so what we're showing is two maps juxtaposition. The the one on the top is uh, is the map of the United States with all the core labs, um, and then below that is the uh, the um, Innovate Bio Network. And so you can see that there's you know, as you'd expect, where there's places there's a lot of R and D. There's a lot of uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of community colleges teaching biotech, and there's a lot of core labs. The uh, the broader impacts, you know, is is you think about what the potential with this. There's really near near term uh, kinds of things, and then longer term. So you know, on the near term, you have uh, we have opportunities to create new cr uh, training and professional development. Um, we can enhance the post two year uh, academic and business career development. Uh, really form a lot of core lab community college partnerships. This can lead to externships and uh, for faculty, internships for students, industry advisors for uh, for advisory boards. Um, so there's there's just a lot of lot of potential there. Uh, increasing instrument access. You know these instruments, as we know, are expensive. Uh, you could you know work with with a lab to use their instrument and you know, use your budget for supplies and personnel and, uh, and internships in, in a project that involved a core lab. You could, um, you know, and then, and then longer term, it's can we start to develop core lab specific skill standards and credentialing? There's just a paper uh, by, um, uh, about associations and how they're getting involved now in, in skill development because a lot of the scientific associations that, you know, have a community of people who understand what, uh, you know what they're looking for and what they what needs to be done and and so they're starting to look at at how to develop new kinds of uh, skill standards we we know that uh, through this we can you know continue to increase workforce diversity and uh, and and really importantly i think through FASEB and, and abrf advocacy is start to promote technical career interest at nih and and really start to enhance uh, nsf's impact you know i, I know uh, NSF would love it if we if we could diversify a bit and if we can get into some of the other uh, funding agencies uh, to to achieve these goals and then ultimately it's continuing this shift um, and we see this starting to happen so it's a good time to really be focusing on it the shift from hiring in in you know focusing from degrees to skills and so that's I think one of the really important long-term impacts that uh, that can happen from this work if you break it down into you know how we're thinking about goals and activities is you know the first one is is creating these core lab partnerships so you know some kind of pair up program where in uh, communities where you have a, a university with with uh, core labs and a community college you know getting them to work together um, you know abrf has an annual meeting but it also has five chapters that are regionally distributed that also have annual meetings so there's a lot of opportunity through the chapters and the national uh, group to get involved and work with uh, with ABRF labs. The um, professional development aspect is really developing new kinds of analysis modules and and uh, and tools that can go into the classroom. We highlighted flow cytometry as a model for development, and that's why we talked about it today. And and we're developing that in part of the proposal, so we can say, okay, so this is how we go deep in one area, but the other kinds of areas, when you look at genomics, you look at imaging, you look at proteomics, they're gonna follow a similar kind of pattern. So doing one very well will help you then lead to the other kinds of things. And then at the annual meeting, we wanna to start to add a, a workforce development track so we can discuss these issues in, uh, in sessions and have people um, have, you know, our, our members from our community, um, Innovate Bio, and then ABRF uh, together at the meeting to talk about issues. And then and the last one is really thinking about this excellence in policy, you know. So this is the new skill standards um, and ABRF kind of, of, uh, of credential that, that focuses on these kinds of skills, uh, you know, um, skills-based hiring uh, success stories so that we can continue to build momentum in terms of uh, skills and then advocate for a technical workforce education. So, so those are really kind of the three areas um, that we're going to work on. And, you know, I pulled this, this is something that ATE often shares with people um, about ATE, and this is very aligned, you know, so if you think about the focus on two-year institutions, they want to see partnerships with industry and four-year institutions. You know, there's, there's a lot of dear colleague letters for additional funding people can get for working with four-year institutions. 
And so this really kind of brings together all of these, uh, these three important segments of the pie. And then as we know, a lot of our colleagues are working with high schools so that can pull in that, um, in that dimension as well. But you know, I see this, this kind of uh, proposal as being um, a very, very well aligned with, uh, with ATE. And so how do you get involved? So I'm, the, um, I'm going to be the PI of this. I've, uh, part of it is I've had quite a few years um, working with the community college community. And as I noted, I've been a member of ABRF myself for over 20 years. Uh, Linnea with the National Center will be a co-PI. Uh, Sheena Miche um, with ABRF is going to be a co-PI and Terry is a, a co-PI. So any one of us you can contact. Um, you can also use the Innovate Bio contact form. Sandy has posted a Slack channel invite. And so, you know, whoever you're most comfortable sending a note to or asking to get involved, we'd, we'd love to have you, um, have you be involved. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, open it up for some questions. Thanks, Todd. Well, we have a, a couple minutes left for questions here. I did post, though, I want you to all pay attention that I posted a link to the evaluation in the chat. And I know I'm afraid you can't copy chat. I'm sorry about that. But I know you can click the links and you can also, so you can like open up a window and have that ready and fill that out later. We'd really appreciate it. It really helps us. And we do use that information and planning and um, setting up future talks. So, uh, Anybody have questions? And Terry posted her new email. <laughs> Sorry, Terry. Yeah, and Terry, Terry, <laughs> Terry posted her new email. And if you'd like to unmute and ask your question, that would be fine. Well, I, I want I will actually want to point out one thing that I don't think anybody mentioned about working in core labs, but I think this is a really attractive uh, aspect of core labs that I think may, maybe it got mentioned, but I'm not sure. But that is that if you get a job working at the university, oftentimes you can take one class for free. And so students who have completed community college might find this as a way to maybe slowly, but a way to complete and finish their bachelor's degree because part of it could be paid for by the university. Linnea, you look like you have a question. Well, I have a suggestion. I think one thing- And you're thing, muted, I think. Or maybe not, no. I'm, I'm not muted. No, one, no, suggest, one suggestion, I think the grant will benefit um, if the community is interested. So if you have an interest in this and possibly forming a community college, forming a partnership with a core lab, vice versa, that uh, the best course of action is to gain a list of programs that is interested in this idea and that would be willing to participate because that will be the success for the project is getting these partnerships. I know, yeah, it's great. We've, there's already been three that have started through the course of writing the grant, I know you have a partnership now with, right. the, unit, with the core labs at University UT. of Texas. Yeah, and Josh Carey and um, Carla, they, they have a partnership with OHSU. So Portland Community College and OHSU, and there's probably others I'm missing here. Right, and I think um, the key parameters of the proposal um, the key parameters, as Todd explained, I think it'd be worthwhile for people to identify what interests them most, or if there's several interests, whether it be curriculum development, forming the partnership. And I know for me, when I went and talked to the core facilities at UT, flow cytometry obviously was something that would be the easiest to do one, because they were very clear that it's their mission to provide education and they're already providing courses for students where maybe the other sites at UT, that isn't part of their mission. So it's easier for us to start there. But then of course we have to demonstrate the need in industry because not only will our students go to core labs, but then the training has to be applicable to the needs of industry too. 
So that'll be something else we have to demonstrate that there's a need for this. Yeah, we know there has been a, there is a big need in industry for flow. We've we've even heard from Shoreline's advisory board that having flow having skills with flow cytometry is a differentiating factor sometimes in um, deciding who to employ. And Uwe comments that he's been working on connecting regional interest industry in the University of Arizona and Core Labs and Pima community community college for years. Uwe, you should encourage Pima community community college to join Innovate Bio and work with us. I think that would be um, a really great way to uh, engage and become a collaborator. But there'll be a spot on the grant too, possibly to, you know, curriculum, consortium grants are funded at $3 million. So I have a comment because I noticed, I know that um, this project is really to bring the community colleges and the core labs together and uh, facilitate collaborations. And I can see some collaboration just among this group that may not know each other or may not know their proximity to each other. So for example, and I'm gonna call out Angela Kansani and Heather Seats and Justine, uh, you are proximal to each other and you might not be aware of what each other does and, and the possibility for collaboration. So I would suggest that everybody put their name and location in the chat so that you